The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. The report is that the president is dead. The word we have is that he is dead, that he was sh shot by an assassin at the intersection of Elm and Houston Streets uh, just as he was going into the underpass. The word we have is from a doctor on the staff of Parkland Hospital who says that it is true. He was in tears when he told me just a moment ago. Black limousines with darkened windows converged on a hotel where private security guards imposed ironclad control. The limos carried royalty, political power brokers, and industrial titans to a secret meeting that will last all weekend. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? The Bilderberg Group consists of the heads of all of the managing roundtable groups that steer individual countries picture the elite power structure of the world as a giant pyramid with only the elite of the elite at the tip top of the capstone. The group has been so secretive that until the mid 1980s the controlled corporate media denied its existence. Into the late 1990s coverage only consisted of rare one-line mentions. With the rise of the alternative media, their stranglehold on information has begun to slip. In Bilderberg's long history, 
Many reporters attempting to cover the group have been harassed, detained, and even jailed. And the thing that first impressed me most was calls in 1957 by the late, great Westbrook Pegler, a widely syndicated columnist. He wrote two lengthy columns about how approximately 100 leaders of international finance, heads of state, high public officials, were meeting behind armed guards to close doors on Jekyll Island, sealed off. What are these powerful internationalists doing? And why is it so secret? Why does it have armed guards outside? Why is it sealed off? The newspapers totally ignore it. Not a word. Total blackout in the United States. 120 of the world's most powerful men, heads of state from Europe, high officials of the United States government, Treasury, White House, state, defense, they're setting the world agenda now. The reason they want secrecy is because they're doing evil. Evil is done under the cover of darkness. Good works are done in the sunshine. They're planning the corporate agenda. They're not uh, planning the uh, democratic human journey agenda, in my opinion. Mussolini had a definition, is when the interests of the corporation take completely over from all other interests, and that's fascism. He said it should probably be called corporatism. Well, call it corporatism, call it fascism, call it neo-lib, neo -lib, neo -con There's a whole variety of political words, depending on which side of the stripe you come from, to start with, which describes the thing. But what they are describing is the complete end of democracy, the end of what matters to people, the end of what happens to the human journey. And for that reason, I think this is revolting. To all of you, we tell you, you are not our queens, you are not our kings, you are not our gods. We do not belong to you. We are not your slaves. We stand as free humans and stood since the beginning of time against the strong men, against the thugs, against the bullies. We will defeat your world government. We will defeat world taxation. We will defeat your control grid. God is on our side. I stand before the creator of the universe. And I ask the creator of the universe, as our founding fathers did in 1776, to leave God and direct us and to give us the power and the foresight and the understanding and the will to stand against your entire agenda, including your final plan of world population reduction of 80% that Henry Kissinger penned in 1973. You will and you are failing now. Your new world order will fall. Humanity will defeat you. The answer to 1984 is 1776. Yeah! This is Grudowski of We Are Change.org. I am joined by Mark Anderson, an amazing journalist, a Bilderberg investigator for many years, and also Jim Tucker's protege. Now, Anderson, uh, we are at a very special Bilderberg. This is unlike any other year before. The security, the paranoia, the fear is higher than ever. Why? Well, I think they're at a very pivotal stage in their globalist plans. Certainly with 15 topics, they're trying to cover a lot of ground in the notoriously short amount of time that they spend at each meeting. Of course, what goes on between Bilderberg meetings, not just at them, is very important. So 15 major topics, huge ones, USA elections, they've got a handle on that. They've, they're going to want to know who the president is and have a lot of influence there. The, one of their topics you know, is globalization. Hell, you can park the whole universe under that. It's so broad, but uh, they also have European strategy, so it shows that they're strategizing. They're not simply uh, listening listening to each other talk and sipping uh, tea and caviar. And so, you know, they're covering a lot of ground. The, they're trying to prevent the EU and Eurozone unraveling. Grexit is in the news even now in Der Standard. This is the newspaper, Der Standard, that Bilderberg member Oscar Bronner, who attends every year, is the publisher of. Right in today's paper, Sunday, June 14, there's a big article about Grexit. They're very, very concerned. My inside and outside, outside sources tell me that uh, Greece is going to leave the Eurozone. Uh, Bilderberg member Martin Wolf, a longtime Bilderberg attendee who's a journalist for Financial Times, uh, was told by a Citigroup representative that they are literally as afraid 
now of the EU and the Eurozone unraveling as they were in the early days of European integration when they first created the European coal and steel community, right back to the very roots of EU uh, European integration, which was a major thrust of the initial formation of Bilderberg. So they are, they are literally looking right down to the roots of this thing and saying, is this thing going to hold together or not? And we got to remember that much of what they do is to try and keep together what they've already done, not just forge new plans. They've yep. got to do the new and the old. Yep. Now you said a great thing with the agenda that the Bilderberg Group released publicly. It's like having a menu with only the word food on it. It's very vague. And, and you characterized it perfectly when you said that. Uh, but I'm curious, there seems to be a lot more uh, kind of military industrial complex people, a lot more people tied into the war machine this year at Bilderberg than any other previous year, and kind of less of the financial market, less of the IMF, less of the World Bank. Uh, from your sources inside and out, is there something brewing with maybe, uh, obviously Iran is also on the list, Russia is also on the list, our main kind of two enemies. Where do you see Bilderberg and their networks coming together and the military industrial complex being a strong presence here with the future, with uh, the kind of relationships that we have with Iran and Russia? Well, it's there's a lot here, but yeah, Iran's on there. Like you say, that's a topic. So is Russia. Last year, Ukraine was a topic, and the NATO chief, the new one, Jens Stoltenberg, is here, having replaced Rasmussen. And yeah, you have the Danish uh, head of intelligence. You have more intel-related people, cyber, such as Eric Schmidt of Google and Alex Karp and uh, Peter Thiel, that are involved in a lot of high technology, uh, high techy projects. And with all the tension on the Russian border uh, being carried out by NATO, who is really more of the aggressor, far less than Putin could ever think about, there does seem to be, and you can't nail every part of this down, but there does seem to be an emphasis on uh, getting Europe weaned off its energy dependency on Russia, get it weaned onto energy dependency with Europe, and to keep pushing the war envelope uh, and really pushing the envelope toward Russia. Uh, Russian-related things have been on there two years in a row now. Iran's on there. Uh, you have this jaundiced view of Iran. And uh, as a side note, the Council on Foreign Relations, a well-known Bilderberg-connected think tank, which is always represented at Bilderberg by Robert Rubin, the former Goldman Sachs, former U.S. Treasury. Rubin is here this year, of course. The CFR has already vetted three U.S. presidential candidates, Lindsey Graham, anti-Iran warmonger, uh, Marco Rubio, anti-Iran warmonger, and Hillary Clinton, anti-Iran warmonger. And they're also all anti-Russia. Uh, so everything's kind of lining up to, to this West versus East uh, brinkmanship. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are fewer sitting U.S. congressmen, fewer U.S. senators, fewer currently serving U.S. officials, too, on top of what you said. There's more of a European parliamentary representation than American, but like you say, very heavy intelligence, military, they are definitely at a turning point, a break in the road. It definitely feels like it being here with the paranoia. This is unlike any of Bilderberg that I covered before, with just the fear, with the security, with being hassled and harassed. I mean, it is virtually impossible to even get close to you guys. Every year I always find a way to f get one of them. This year virtually impossible which which makes our job so much harder especially with all the pressure with all the police they hear and doing all this but as we know Bilderberg uh, is only one kind of organization there's also a network of other organizations uh, interlinked that kind of work together that you do a lot of great research on how do you see the kind of inner networking these kind of uh, think tanks this kind of uh, outside organizations involved in Bilderberg well a major one is this uh, rising star in Bilderberg Klaus Kleinfeld of Alcoa now he's with the business roundtable which which is one of the most powerful pro-corporate lobbies on the face of the earth. <clears throat> um, the Business Roundtable had its sights on uh, Trans-Pacific partnerships and things like that, uh, similar things back in 2005. I've got a report about that. Kleinfeld is here every year, and um, his Business Roundtable is bending the arms of U.S. congressmen right now to pass fast-track authority for Obama. Uh, to get the Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic partnerships, which are very Bilderberg friendly, and as Jim Tucker would report, they get their Trans-Pacific or their Pacific Union rather. That's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Their Atlantic Union. That's the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Tucker pointed out early that these big, big building blocks with their economic trade deals would be a major uh, construction uh, cornerstones, if you will, uh, major. Uh, construction components of of a world state, a corporate world state, and so. Kleinfeld is a major one through the Business Roundtable trying to get the uh, fast track through Congress. The other one I mentioned a bit ago, the CFR, uh, which is vetting U.S. presidential candidates, and then Robert Rubin brings that information to Bilderberg through the CFR. There's, there's, uh, it goes back a long ways. Just a few years ago, I covered the transatlantic economy and, excuse me, transatlantic academy, pardon me, and 
they were talking then, four years ago, at a Chicago Council on Global Affairs meeting that I attended about how to give Greece a haircut. How do we get the Greeks to pay as much as possible on the bonds that are floated to them to bail them out, give them as much austerity as possible, cut wages, raise taxes. How much of a haircut can we give them before they complain too much? And they were talking about do they extend the indebtedness for 10 years? Do they make the indebt indebtedness a shorter term, longer term? And you, you go to the Transatlantic Academy, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the Brookings Institution, and you hear parts of Bilderberg that later plug into the hub. And, and they're all reading off the same page. Brookings is huge at Bilderberg. Not this year, but most years. Lai Chang of, of Brookings, who also has consulted U.S. presidential candidates. See, so this is how they work. Bilderberg can have plausible deniability, but these think tanks that plug into it do a lot of the legwork and yep. then bring it to Bilderberg. Yep, just like the mafia. They have a hidden person, and then they have the you know work guy just get everything else done for him. And it's exactly how it works down here. And you, you kind of pinpointed it and networked it very, very perfectly. Uh, as we know, Goldman Sachs, who does participate in these meetings also pumped and dumped Greece and just destroyed it and now they're uh, in this insane mess but it's always order out, out of chaos so so very well put yes what, what I'm seeing is more war more financial cat catastrophe uh, coming from the Bilderberg meeting am I right or am I wrong no you're right because the Bilderbergers are the uh custodians of a system and they're like a central hub they're not the most powerful thing in the world necessarily we don't want to give them too much credit but they're like a central hub to where these other organizations feed in as spokes and they're basically the protectors of the debt-based money system the basic framework that makes them and their brethren wealthy that keeps the bloodlines of royalty in place they're, they they are the most protected people on earth but they'll scream at us if we want a small tariff on Chinese imports in the United States and say we're protectionists and just a bunch of rednecks with guns yeah. they are the most protected people on earth in every aspect of their existence and how dare they call us protectionists yeah. and as you say the Meeting at the Inner Alpen in Telfs, Austria, on the west side of Austria, is the most secluded place you and I have probably ever dealt with. You can't see it from the street. you got to be a, practically in an eagle's nest or an eagle in the sky to see it at all. And uh, unlike last year in Denmark, they're right along a busy boulevard. I don't know what that's about. But um, it, it is very tight. They're at a crossroads. They're at a breaking point, maybe you could even call it. Um, you know, they put their socks on like you and me. They're not omnipotent. They've, they've got to keep working at this and do everything they can to hold together what they've put together since 1954 and yet at the same time try and move forward. Yeah. And it's up to us to expose them because the U.S. media, unlike mainstream media in Europe, just is not doing yeah. it. They're blacking it out again. Yeah, They're not only protected, but they're also paranoid, which is kind of the activity of globalist mafia thugs, <laughs> which is exactly like how they're acting. Any other comments on this year's Bilderberg? Well, I, I would say that they're going to probably be in the States next year. They tend to be three Europe and one either States or Canada, kind of three and one. The Trilateral Commission is two overseas, one America, two overseas, one America. I think we're looking at the States next year. That's where I'm looking at. I, that's not, a, a, as we know, that's not foolproof, but that's the pattern. They've met in the States ten times. This is their third time in Austria. All we can do is keep dogging them uh, to where they get tired of the publicity and of course, they have all these different connections. They have ways of shifting the responsibility around. And that's why we have to follow them year round, not just at these meetings. What do you say about their influence? I mean, there's very powerful people there. Why does it have to be so secret? I mean, there is no secrecy. It's. Uh there is absolutely no I, I talked to the hotel it's, guys. It's just a private meeting. If you want to know the evils lurking within the Bilderberg group, look no further than the following quotes from Bilderberg insiders and those who've studied the secretive cabal. Bill Gates. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out uh, per unit of energy. Probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back from high school algebra, but let's, let's take a look. Dr. Henry Kissinger at the 1992 Bilderberg meeting at Evians, France. Today, America would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order, referring to the 1991 LA riots. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there were an outside threat from beyond, i.e. an extraterrestrial invasion, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will plead to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. 
when presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by the world government. David Rockefeller wrote in his book Memoirs, If the Council on Foreign Relations raises the hackles of the conspiracy theorists, the Bilderberg meetings must induce apocalyptic visions of omnipotent international bankers plotting with unscrupulous government officials to impose cunning schemes on an ignorant and unsuspecting world. At the 1991 Bilderberg meeting at Badan, Germany, a meeting also attended by Bill Clinton, David Rockefeller said, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. And David Rockefeller from his book Memoirs again, some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Already we've seen leading members of Congress used to always attend the Speaker of the House, of uh, representatives, ranking senators uh, would attend. Now they don't dare because they get mail from their own constituents. Their own, uh, voters in their own congressional district are in their st home state for the senators saying if you uh, do business with uh, these criminals in anymore, we'll never vote for you again. We'll vote for anybody else. And they've been politically frightened out of the ballgame. 19th century politician and historian Lord Acton said the issue which has swept down the centuries and which will have to be fought sooner or later is the people versus the banks. The ruthless and cunning behavior of the attendees of the Bilderberg Conference can be summed up in the Machiavelli quote, men are so simple and so much inclined to obey immediate needs that a deceiver will never lack victims for his deceptions. We can see the ripples of secrecy in the Bilderberg Group and that of President Obama's TPP and Adam Weishaupt, founder of the Illuminati's quote, The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always concealed by another name and another occupation. Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild said, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the money supply. And if those quotes aren't creepy enough for you, David Spangler of the United Nations Directory of the Planetary Initiative said, No one will enter the New World Order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the New Age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. And it's not as if we have not been warned time and time again. Congressman Lewis T. McFadden in 1932 said, We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board. This evil institution has impoverished the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Woodrow Wilson, who signed the Federal Reserve into existence, said, I am a most unhappy man. I've unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. It lurks in the forest. A 45 foot high stone owl ready to sacrifice an effigy is Mola! 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 The great horned giant Babylonian pagan fire god mascot of the Bohemian Grove! Watch Moloch's annual ritualistic thrill show spectacular, The Creation of Hair! <laughs> Businessmen, bankers, politicians, and presidents side by side, ridding themselves of no care! 
For two weeks in July, the elite are out to cross-dress, drink wine, and touch penises. That's right, it's Manorama. This hooded rogue satanic summer camp with skulls is men only. Get down and dirty in the woods. Plus gourmet food. A barbecue. A baby barbecue. You want to barbecue the babies. But remember, we need spiders come not here. Mr. Gurgit, say hi to Moloch for me, Canaanite deity, and I'll see you at Eyes Wide Shut, baby. Located at 20601 Bohemian Avenue, just off the 12 freeway in Monte Rio. Exactly 75.2 miles north of San Francisco. Turn right on Fulton, left on Occidental, right at Green Hill, another left at Great right at Bohemian Highway, and one more right at Bohemian Avenue in there. Brought to you by MK Ultra. Be control. Be ultra. Weaving spiders coming out here? <laughs> yeah!
my lip. <laughs> this motor feels like it needs a tune up. Yeah, at least. Kind of real quick. Yeah, it's really interesting because I don't know. It sounds like they're going to have a busted verdict. Or no verdict. Now a question. What have Herbert Hoover, Art Linkletter, Jack London, and Richard Nixon all had in common? Well, they've all been members of the exclusive all-male Bohemian Club in California, where every year at this time, the elite from around the country get together for two and a half weeks of uh, fun and games. Steve Shepard has this special assignment report. More than 2,000 members of San Francisco's exclusive and all-male Bohemian Club have once again descended on Northern California. These men will spend most of the month of July encamped on some 2,700 acres of pristine and privately owned redwood forest. Forest very much like this. The place is called Bohemian Grove, and it's located just 80 miles north of San Francisco. The Grove is the Bohemian Club's summer retreat, and its facilities are hidden beneath lush forest canopy extending south from the banks of Sonoma County's Russian River. For more than a century, the camp has been a place where club members and guests from all across America gather to relax. The retreat is divided into dozens of small camps, the most prominent of which is called Mandalay. Among its members are businessmen like Leonard Firestone and Edgar Kaiser, and political figures like Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, William French Smith, and George Shultz. President Reagan, Vice President Bush, and Defense Secretary Weinberger are members of other camps. Richard Nixon is a Bohemian, and so are high-ranking executives of such companies as Eastern Airlines, Standard Oil of Indiana, and Bank of America. For the most part, the men of Bohemian Grove are over 50, highly successful, and, according to many employees, politically conservative. Well, each year, uh, many of them seem to have a stunt, uh, or try to come up with a stunt. Last year, 1980, uh, the popular button was uh, Free the Fortune 500. Membership in the Grove is by invitation only and is determined by such factors as social standing, occupation, and personal connections. Privacy is one of the Grove's most cherished virtues. Members may not photograph, record, speak, or write about activities at the retreat. While many public officials are Grove members, the press is a distinctly unwelcome guest. We're from ABC News. Well, get back there. Get back there. Can we talk to somebody in there? Get back there. Anyone willing to navigate a boat up the Russian River can get a glimpse of the northern edge of the compound, but that's about all. Still, there are outsiders who have researched the Grove. Sociology professor William Dumhoff found out enough to write a book on the place. Well, I think it's a playground for the powerful. It's a place where uh, wealthy men from all of the United States gather for two weeks to uh, relive summer camp with this ceremony called the Cremation of Care that uh, begins the, uh, the uh, two-week encampment where the body of dull care symbolizing woes and concerns is burned on an altar in front of a big owl statue. When that ceremony ends, they all start to cheer and yell and hand each other a beer. And... Other regular activities include the production of two plays, one of which involves major sets, orchestral music, and extravagant costumes. The other play appears to be just a bit on the lighter side, at least judging from these old photos. Members also spend time swimming, hiking, relaxing in the sun, and doing a bit of drinking from the Grove's own privately labeled spirits. Like a boys' camp, the Grove has a symbol, in this case, a somewhat fierce-looking owl. It also has a patron saint, St. John of Nepomuk, a legitimate 13th-century Bohemian canonized for his sense of honor. What the Grove does not have is any women, not even as employees. Despite its camp-like atmosphere, the Grove does host some serious business. To the degree that there's anything important happens at the Bohemian Grove, it's political. The important speeches that have been made by, at the Bohemian Grove have been made, for instance, and the best example, by Richard Nixon. Eisenhower gave a speech there. It was the first time the uh, West Coast establishment really saw him close up. Discussions at the Grove in the 1930s helped lead to the development of nuclear power and the atomic bomb. It was at the Grove in 1967 that Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan hashed out differences over their presidential ambitions. Each year, guests like Henry Kissinger or Spignew Brzezinski address members on their areas of expertise. Presidential counselor Edwin Meese will be among this year's speakers. And each year, other guests come to the Grove simply to enjoy themselves. This year, CIA Director William Casey is a scheduled guest of John McCone, former CIA director. Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn has been invited as a guest of baseball owner Peter O'Malley. 
Despite the presence of so many notables, the Grove is not without its small headaches. Anti-nuclear demonstrators gathered near the entrance to the retreat this year to wave signs and chant slogans. The Grove is also facing a suit from the state of California because it refuses to hire women. Still, the Bohemian Grove seems in no danger of passing. Herbert Hoover called it the world's greatest men's party, and there is a list of powerful people waiting to get in on it. Steve Shepard, ABC News, San Francisco. Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger canceled plans to go to Bohemian Grove in California this weekend because of the possibility of more flare-ups in the Lebanon crisis. But even without the Defense Secretary, the Bohemian Grove will not close down for lack of power. And what is the Bohemian Grove? Well, it's a kind of summer camp for the powerful, an all-male gathering in great secrecy. More from Dennis Murphy. George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, and West German Chancellor Schmidt arrived by car. The chairman of General Motors and U.S. Steel came in by private jet. If you would look at the guest list over a period of five years, um, I don't think there would be anybody of any importance in America uh, who was missing from that list. Cabinet officers and captains of industry are going to summer camp at Bohemian Grove, an all-male retreat secluded in the Redwood Forest two hours north of San Francisco. Outsiders are not invited. What's hidden away is a little bit of Boy Scout camp and a lot of fraternity hokum. There are rituals, bonfires, and the burning of effigies. The members live in lodges with names like Wolf and Caveman. Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, William French Smith, and George Schultz are bunkmates at Mandalay Camp. President Reagan's camp, Owl's Nest, is famous for its Eggs Benedict and Ramos Gin Fizz breakfast. But for the most part, stories about what happens in these redwoods are hard to come by. A campground statue reminds Bohemians to keep their mouths shut about the grove. I've heard a lot of good music there. I've met a lot of interesting people, and I look forward to listening to music again. But there are employees who tell tales out of school. You know, I mean, half of these guys, you know, from what I can tell, you know, stay loaded or stay bombed, you know, the entire time that they're there. I mean, they stagger into breakfast and, and stagger out from dinner. But at the same time, you know, they're, um, they're, they're talking business. And sometimes those business talks send ripples far beyond the grove. Sociology uh, Reagan, professor William Domhoff. Uh, Reagan and Nixon talked at length in 1967 in the Grove to decide who would go first in Republican primaries. While decision makers are cementing friendships, protesters outside the gate are keeping a vigil. To them, the Bohemian Grove is an all-white, all-male, undemocratic policy-making arm of the government. They want the Bohemians to go home. But summer camp won't end until next week. Dennis Murphy, NBC News, Monterio, California. A deputy sheriff said most of the Bohemians had left earlier knowing there might be some trouble. The stated reasons for the demonstration were the connections of the club's members to nuclear weapons research, the alleged political and business deals made there, and the exclusion of women from membership. The club's members include Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Gerald Ford, and Richard Milhouse Nixon. Good evening. The Bohemian Club, the exclusive men's club that President Reagan is supposed to belong to, is increasingly becoming the focus of protests. Protests by people who think that its membership concentrates too much wealth, too much power in any one group to remain private. Each year at this time, the Bohemians hold their summer camp in Sonoma County. And each year at this time, there are demonstrations. And this year, as Aaron Edwards reports, some of the demonstrators went to jail. There was no violence. It was a display of civil disobedience by members of a peace and human rights coalition. And it was directed against the men attending the annual two-week encampment at Bohemian Grove. Reportedly, some of the Bohemian Club members include Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, Caspar Weinberger, George Schultz, and others. Those who move to get themselves arrested say they are emphasizing their strong feelings for world peace, for equality, and for a clean environment. And this is the first time they have blocked the only way in and out. 
We're trying to point out the fact that the Bohemian Grove contains the corporate leaders of America that in secret, without any women at all, make policy for our nation, including nuclear policy, war policy, militarism, and a denying of benefits to the people as exemplified by Reaganism. Many of the attending members had a chance to leave early, before the expected protest that trapped some and delayed them for hours. The protesters said they were blocking the exit because Bohemian Club members are too dangerous to re-enter society. In Sonoma County, Aaron Edwards, Channel 7 News. 21 people were arrested outside the Bohemian Grove. year, 2,000 of the most powerful men in America descend upon a tiny town in California's wine country. Political heavyweights, corporate leaders, and celebrities arrive at a meeting of the world's most exclusive men's club. It's considered to be the wealthiest, most powerful concentration of men anywhere in the Western world at any given time. The Bohemian Club of San Francisco has attracted a host of men, from Henry Kissinger to Clint Eastwood, and every Republican president since Herbert Hoover. They've all been guests in what is billed as an annual cultural and recreational retreat in 3,000 acres of Redwoods. It's as if the, uh, all the boardrooms and uh, the Supreme Court uh, major law firms had all emptied out onto Fraternity Row and was somehow transposed to a redwood forest. Security at the Bohemian Grove is extremely tight. It's almost as if there were a military installation down there. Everything is kept under wraps, and in this case, under the trees. Members and guests at the Bohemian Grove are sworn to secrecy about what goes on inside. What most people do not know is that for more than a century, they've kicked off their retreat with a spectacular nighttime ceremony. From the air, the encampment is lit up with torches. Suddenly, the night is ablaze as robed men begin the cremation of care, a ritual that symbolizes the shedding of the burdensome responsibilities of the outside world. It is the start of a two-week celebration. John Vanderzee, once a waiter at the Grove, authored a book about his experiences. He says once inside, these very public figures are quick to enjoy the freedom of privacy. There was a story that one man told that, uh, that he realized that he was really in the Bohemian Grove when he saw Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon relieving themselves against the same redwood tree. The motto of the Bohemian Club is weaving spiders come not here. Simply put, that tells members to leave their business and political deals at home and simply have a good time. But some people say with this much power and this much money located in one place, there is more to the Bohemian Club than campfires and canoeing. It's considered very, very bad form to use the Grove, especially for overt purposes, advance your own interests. At the same time, uh, it's a very useful association that friendships and contacts you make there carry on into the, into the outside world. Important issues are discussed daily during Lakeside Talks. Insiders say that speeches given here can make or break political careers. Some claim that political deals made in the Grove have changed the course of history. In 1967, uh, during the encampment, uh, Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon arrived at an understanding that Reagan, who had just been elected governor of California, would not enter the 1968 presidential race unless Nixon faltered. For years, protesters have demonstrated outside the Grove for a variety of causes. Mary Moore, a local political activist, feels that such closed meetings of the elite undermine the democratic process. The point is that this is where ruling class bonding takes place, and that place is not open to minority people, to people of color. It is not open to women. It is open to white men who pretty much run this world. They're like overgrown Boy Scouts, only a lot more dangerous as far as the world is concerned. Others in the tiny town of Monterio see the Bohemian Grove as a source of money and jobs. The sudden wave of wealth also brings in outsiders, prostitutes like Carol Lee, who are attracted by the prospect of 2,000 wealthy men. For the last five years, she's worked the bars across the river from the Grove. She says prostitution here is more of a legend than a business. 
that the men who see prostitutes are in an incredibly small minority. I mean, it's not that all these guys are seeing prostitutes. I, I think people should understand that. It's a really small percentage. It's just that it has symbolic meaning in the Grove, that all the Grove members talk about it. There's an idea that men who are powerful do have women available. It's good for men's ego. Their relationship with prostitutes is highly mythologized. During the retreat, prostitutes appear to operate openly without interference from law enforcement. Inside the compound, there have been persistent rumors about closet homosexuality. Don Heimforth, a former waiter, says there have always been relationships between club members and employees. And, uh, one black waiter, a uh, gay black waiter, uh, years ago said it's whenever they would come over to the employees' quarters, and he, he made the comment that uh, it was not unlike coming down from the big house uh, to the slaves' quarters for a piece of Such allegations about the camp have angered many who feel that leaders who adamantly embrace traditional values are not what they appear to be. These are the hypocrites who, on the outside, are not giving the money that is needed for AIDS, that is not given the money, you know, that is needed for certain kinds of research, and yet they, you know, indulge in this on the quiet. What gets me is the secrecy of this and the hypocrisy of it. There isn't too much uh, overt bad behavior because most of these men are to the manner born and they're, you know, they're well behaved. Insiders we spoke with all said heavy drinking seemed to be the most popular activity. For me, the, the eye-opener was the amount of alcoholism. Uh, I mean, I mean, hardcore, you know, uh, third-stage uh, alcoholism. Watching men going into blackouts and DTs uh, at the dining tables. Officials at the Bohemian Club refuse to discuss what goes on at the Grove. The club was recently ordered by the Supreme Court to employ women for the first time. Despite the controversy, rumors, and the possibility of women working there, Many feel the tradition of power at the Bohemian Grove will endure. The Grove would uh, continue to attract members simply because it's an association that remains extremely useful in the outside world. And there seems to be some deep need within men for this return to nature, male bonding, an extension of a night without rules. critics as a Boy Scout camp for the rulers of America. Then we have the right to tell these scum what to do with their bodies. The politics of peace and the environment facing down the power elite. We can't show you television pictures of the inside of the grove down the road here. The media aren't allowed in. In fact, the Bohemians have a long history of secrecy. The Bohemian Club was founded 120 years ago in San Francisco by a group of newspaper men, businessmen, and artists. Modern-day members include some of the most influential American men of the 20th century. President Bush is a member, along with former President Ronald Reagan. Also, past Secretaries of State George Shultz and Henry Kissinger. Yeah, I see it's really a, a playground for the powerful or a Boy Scout camp for the very rich. University of California and professor there, Bill Domhoff wrote a book on the history of the exclusive club and the club's annual summer encampment at the Grove. They drink together, they hang out, they shoot the bull, they burp, they yell. And this is what it really is about. We're now blood brothers. And the Bohemians have a flair for unusual rituals. At the beginning of the encampment, they burn an effigy of care. It's a symbolic way to cast off the cares of life and the burdens they must carry. It's a time to relax, share ideas, and be waited upon. But they, they just get away from Washington, and they really do have a good time. By your grave, I'm sure that you're dead. But the protesters see the Bohemians as men responsible for most of the world's evils. We do know that the Manhattan Project, which led to the atom bomb, was conceived in Bohemian Grove in 1942. We do know that Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon cut a deal in there to decide who would run for president first. But is the encampment really a place where conspiracies are hatched and political deals made? Most of these people are too drunk to make a deal, let alone remember that they made a deal. The protesters say the Bohemians are drunk, drunk with power. They want them to go home and the grove to be opened up to the homeless. You're under arrest for trespassing. I'm getting up. But again this year, the protesters came uninvited. The exclusive Bohemian Club is, after all, for members only. Fred Wayne for CNN at the Bohemian Grove, California.
Hundreds of protesters will clash this Saturday with prominent national figures as they arrive for their exclusive all-male Bohemian summer camp escape. Channel 50's Susan Maddox has this report. As the nation's power brokers continue to filter in for their high-priced summer camp out at the Bohemian Grove, they'll once again be met by angry protesters. And to make the point to the American public that the real decision-making that happens in this country does not happen through our elected representatives. It happens through a, uh, an established good old boys network, uh, what a lot of us refer to as the, the ruling class. It happens, uh, the real decisions that get made in this country are not necessarily in Congress. They are usually behind closed doors. Bohemian Grove just happens to be a prime example of one of many places that these men get together without public scrutiny. Moore says their absence for the last couple of years was due to the burden of other crises, but they're returning this year because of the increased ranks of people concerned about their future. Uh, it, it basically organized itself with a little help from us because of people's feelings about not only the war abroad but the war at home. The protesters plan to offset one of the rituals performed by the Bohemian members, the burning an effigy of dull care, symbolizing their vow to leave their worries behind. Uh, at night, we are going to be having a, uh, what we're calling the resurrection of care, which is in counterpoint to their very bizarre ceremony that's called the cremation of care. And when we re resurrect care, we will be doing it in a loving way. We will be doing it in a nonviolent way. We will be doing it in a way that we think it's necessary for people to understand that they have got to care and act on that caring. In Monte Rio, Susan Maddox, Channel 50 News. Peter, you witnessed children being sacrificed at the Grove? You know, I did. And uh, I've made this very public. It uh, is uh, revolving around the case, of the missing child case of Kevin Collins. And if anybody looks it up on the internet, they still say that it's an unsolved case. I've been to law enforcement in San Francisco. I made a mention of this for the first time back in 2003, while I was still in jail for another issue. And I thought I would be on death row. I, myself, Peter Alexander Chernoff, I'm one of three people that have witnessed ritualistic murders of children during the 80s up here, uh, during the 80s. Uh, the other one is David Scherter, and the, the third person is uh, Paul Bonacci, who was uh, made well known in the book by Senator John DeCamp, The Franklin Cover-Up. Peter, I'm filing suit against the Bohemian Club of San Francisco. I'm calling for an injunction of the continuation of the cremation of care. I want to see the end of the satanic rituals and the sacrifice of children and the molestation of children at the Grove. Going back a period of 130 years, there may be as many as 1,300 people and bodies that have been buried there. I want a dig. I'm calling for a dig. I'm calling for the cadaver dogs to come in and the equipment that can identify bodies that have been buried underneath the ground there. Are you in favor of that? I would be, and uh, it would be an interesting thing to see what happens. I can tell you from past experience and what I know from other sources, also firsthand, <coughs> is they go way out of their way to dispose of bodies. And, um, uh, but I would definitely support that. You know, I watched uh, a couple days ago, just to, just to check on things, I watched a little video talking about the cremation of care, and they were making light of this. Well, the cremation of care, what it is, really, it's a discussion regarding population control. They're making decisions as to what group of millions of people they're going to genocide next. And we all have seen the genocides over the last 10, 15 years for anybody that's paying even a modicum of attention. I am one of three people that has publicly acknowledged being involved in ritualistic murder of children up in Bohemian Grove. Paul Bonacci being one of Nebraska, which you can read uh, Senator John DeCamp's Franklin cover-up. Mm -hmm. It's online. And the second one is David Scherter. That's S-H-U-R-T-E-R. Google davidscherter.com. Mm -hmm. Can we use your testimony in our lawsuit against the Grove? 
Absolutely. I can tell you I'm not a fan of the courts or the or lawyers, but if you think and maybe maybe it maybe there's a turn, maybe there's a spiritual turn going in our favor and the answer is yes. And I'll show you right here uh, what I put out. I'll read it to you as you look at it. Uh, Doug reminded me it was actually 1984. I'm not real good at remembering dates, but at the Bohemian Grove, I was involved in a rather private ritual, Catholic, Nazi, Satanic in nature, a service, a working, if you will, with nine relative unknowns at the time, so to speak, a most unique killing ritual table with nine retractable, long, thin, sharp knives, blades. Young Catholic Kevin Collins, snatched off the streets of San Francisco, was sacrificed. As he lay on the table, the knives were, were brought up through him. And after this, each participant, buoyed by the others, rose to prominence. Leaders of the minions, princes unto mammon. I called it nine knights, nine arms, nine blades. The participants, uh, except for one or two I didn't mention, are... Willie Brown, Arlen Specter, Barney Frank, Roger Mahoney, the L.A. Cardinal, Ratzinger, who's now the Pope, Robert Byrd, George Bush Sr., otherwise known as George Scherf, S-C-H-E-R-F-F. -F. You mean Magog? That's what they call him, the man who wages war against God in the final days of Earth. Yes, and Warren Buffett, and the Master of Ceremonies was Dr. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. So they are involved in ritual murders, satanic Luciferian. They they definitely have these during the 80s. I can't attest to what's going on there now. I believe that most of their work uh, was in certain arenas was done at that time and prior. But a lot of the things that they've done at the, where they put things into motion that we're seeing now or military guys that are currently serving now we've lost five or six thousand but more than more than that number have suicided have they not been sacrificed essentially to satan that's what's going on can we use this on film absolutely you can use this on film a lot of the major magnets uh in uh, in in corporations and media but also uh government come there and uh, male prostitutes are shipped in uh, to service them. Vanity Fair has reported on the fact that their reporter got arrested there, and uh, their report talked about the homoerotic uh, uh, trappings. Uh, I know that when I was there, uh, I was uh, being whistled at and uh, followed around like it was a Looney Tunes Pepe Le Pew cartoon, and I was the cat uh, to the point of I had to just hide in the woods until it got dark so I could <laughs> videotape the ritual. Uh, you would be walking down the forest paths uh, on the 2,700-acre uh, retreat uh, that's in a gorge, and uh, you would have... Uh, men start walking up to you and saying, what are you doing? What camp are you part of? You want to come party with us? You know, people whistle at you. And I was even you know, pretty naive then. I mean, I snuck in. Once I got in, I, I tried to stay away from crowds of people, but they were still uh, coming over. And there have been other reporters. Spy magazines reported on it. Uh, as I said, Vanity Fair has talked about the fact. I mean, any reporter that actually gets in there uh, is uh, approached. And they didn't come over and say, hey, you know, we want to have sex with you right now. It was just, hey, let's have some fun and uh, being whistled at. And so that, that is a large overtone of it. But, but months. Bohemian Grove is a place where they bring the Council on Foreign Relations members, where they bring Trilateral Commission members, where they bring other bankers and CEOs who aren't quite in on the game and say, hey, let's drink, let's party, let's have whatever type of prostitute you want, male, female, we got it. Uh, let's do some fun rituals. Uh, you, know, you know, let's engage in some bizarre Masonic uh, slash Luciferian rituals. Uh, and let's just, you know, party. And then they go out and, and act like conservative men on television. But the truth is, for 15 days a year, they are running around with their hair on fire and their pants down. And uh, again, it's Richard Nixon that said, I mean, if you want me to quote it, he said it's the most goddamn. I mean, is it all right if I quote Richard Nixon? Sure. You can pull it up. Richard Nixon said Bohemian Grove is the most goddamn faggy thing you've ever seen. Uh, and again, I don't you know, say that in a hateful way. That's what Richard Nixon said about it, but he went. And did so you, when I bring did you up see men running around with their pants down? 
And their hair on fire? Um, okay, do you really want to know what I saw? Yes. I saw large posters up with men dressed as women outside of some of the camps with Henry Kissinger bent over simulating sticking his fingers in his rectum. <laughs> All right. Robe, and I'll just leave it at that. And uh, again, you asked. I don't really you know, normally talk about stuff like that, so I, so I told you. And yes, I did see you know, men pulling their pants down and urinating up against trees, but I think everybody does that yeah, in the woods. And in San Diego, you're next on the EIB Network. Hello. Since I have you on the line, Rush, have you seen the video of the Bohemian Grove ceremony that Alex Jones produced that's on Google Video? Uh, no, been invited to Bohemian Grove, but I've never, I've never been there. And I've not, I've not seen the video. Do you know about the uh, activities within the Grove? Can you talk about that? No, because I don't, I've never been there. All, I, all somebody... I know, oh, look at, here's, all I know is that it's a bunch of elitists and power brokers who conduct secret meetings to take over the world, and they run around nude. It's all men. No women are allowed. And they run around, and they, you, can, you can find them going to the bathroom on the side of trees and so forth, and they have people come out and make speeches to them and all that. Uh, and I know it was started by um, uh, members of the San Francisco Symphony way, way, way back who were shunned from San Francisco society, so they formed their own little club there um, up, uh, up in Northern California. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I've... Where do you where do you find these people? You, do you, <laughs> have you ever heard of the Bohemian Grove? Oh, you haven't. He he believes the Bohemian Grove is the CFR in the woods. The Bohemian Grove was started by members of the San Francisco Symphony or some orchestra way way back many 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 years ago, shunned by San Francisco society. They have camps. It goes on for three or four weeks up in the Russian River area of Northern California. Uh, and there are members from all over the world, and they can take guests. There are people that come out and speak to them. It's rustic living. Uh, it's it's great food. It's great it's great cooking. But 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 people believe that it is nothing more than a secret meeting of world conspiracists who are out to take over the world's money supply and uh, and all these uh, other things. Uh, I've been I've been asked to speak at the Bohemian Grove, and I'll guarantee you this. Uh, or who? No. Who was the? Who was the? Who did he hung up? Who was this guy's name? John, is that what? You, uh, John. John in San Diego. John. I guarantee you, if the Bohemian Grove is what you think it is, I would never have been invited there, uh, as many times. Nor would I have been invited to go out and make. Some of my best golf buddies are members of the place, and they go out there and do it. It's just a social thing. It's just a pure social thing, and they do bring in uh, entertainment and speakers. Um. Uh, and it's uh, it's it's rustic rustic living out on the Russian River, and everybody has these fearful conspiracies and theories uh, about it. One of the one of the myths that always goes around about the Bohemian Grove is that if you do go, since it's all men, you can walk around nude if you want. You don't have to get dressed or any of that. You might even see George Schultz uh, relieving himself on the side of a tree. So one night. Some years ago, I was invited to a dinner in Washington of the American Spectator, uh, Bob Tyrrell's fantastic, fabulous magazine and website. And I was seated next to the former Treasury Secretary, the late, great William Simon. And he said, you gotta, you got to get out to the Grove. And I said, you know, I, was, I thought he had a sense of humor. I, was, I, I said, I'd love to get out there because I would love to see George Schultz uh, relieving himself on the side of a tree. And he looked, who told you that? Why? That would never... Wh I, who? I, that, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm shrinking in my seat because I thought he'd understand the humor because I thought there's something everybody. And he was profoundly offended that that's what the reputation of growth was. And I'm talking about George Schultz, the former Secretary of State. Look, I'm probably <clears throat> ruining any chance I'll ever have of being invited back, but I'm just telling you this is the, these are the popular myths about it when it's actually harmless. It's just three or four weeks in the summer where people go out and have a good time. When they're tired of playing golf, they go to Grove.
Yes, sir. Uh, first question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, you gave a keynote speech at the Bohemian Grove Club, sir. A club which openly has mock child sacrifices and satanic me, worship, sir. Say, Can you answer my question, say, sir, please? I was very pleased. I was very pleased with my performance in the debate. It was a good debate. Uh, what about the I Bohemian Grove Club, though, sir? Uh, That's very was, important. They, they do mock human sacrifices there, sir, and you reported being I was, there. I was very pleased with my performance in the debate. Sir, rather do ignore my question, sir. Can we have open dialogue? If you want to be president, let's have an open dialogue about this. You just ignored me, sir. It's not nice. It's not. It's running up a storm about that Bohemian Grove over there. Human sacrifices, a male prostitute shipped in there yearly. I should like to know what goes on over there. That's respectable stuff. I know, isn't it? It's disgusting. What you're doing is not respectable. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about what the, what the governor does over there yearly at Bohemian Grove. This, this is about the debate. This is not an open news conference. Right. Well, with the governor, there's never an open news conference. He talks about AIDS and health care and the same stuff over and over. Governor, Bohemian Grove, actually, you, you said before that you did you did, did you or did you not attend Bohemian Grove in San Francisco? You've been ignoring this question for three and a half years, Governor. Okay, just one last question. Last time we talked, you were kind of like setting up a storm when I brought up the Bohemian Grove. Why is that? The what? The Bohemian Grove. Hey, Newt, what'd you do with the Bohemian Grove? Why don't you never answer that question, sir? Newt, never answer that question. Why do you keep dodging questions about the Bohemian Grove? Why do you keep dodging questions? Great speech, great speech. Hey, Mr. Speaker, what'd you do at the Bohemian Grove? Good to see you, Mr. Speaker. I like photographers, I'm one. How come you keep dodging questions about the Bohemian Grove, sir? should have to, God bless you. Oops, sorry. Newt, seriously, why all the secrecy? And all the winds make merry with thy dust. Bring fire! You know, it's nice to know that there's some people who have fantasy lives not that fantasy. have nothing it's to touch with. Nice there's to, video nice to have you here. Bye bye. You can't answer the bye question. Bye. You can't. Can not you answer the question? See you later. You're a, you're a member of a several very prestigious organizations, such as the Fertilizer Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. Well, you are members of these, right? How are you? And they um, tend to share a lot of members with each other. Back in 1993, you made comments about the club that you were in, uh, called Bohemian Club, about you know, didn't want to run around naked in the woods, you know, and... Uh, okay, well, I have... Uh, okay. Washington Times, um, June 11, 1993. Okay. okay, and you retired from the Bohemian Club and 17 other organizations. Okay, after you made those statements three days afterwards. Um, now, after you made the statement that uh, they paraphrase it here, um, that you would not run around naked at its annual Bohemian Grove encampment and insisting that you would not go. Do you have a, a, a quotation? Do you have a quotation? Yes, this is actually the first paragraph of the article. I don't have a direct quote. Um, Gergen quits Bohemian Club. Uh, I don't know where that came from. There's no direct quote. I never said that. I did resign from the club uh, when I went to the club.
Okay. Now, you, I, I'm assuming this is correct. Did you also resign from these other 17 organizations? I resigned. I resigned for a long time. Okay. Organization under the Clinton administration. Okay. If you're interested, I'm now member of the Clinton administration. Maybe to film what's going on there. Um, just a, we're just journalists. Is this a film or No, I'm just filming him. Never, ever do this. Do never go out and ambush making a fit and not coming to us. Oh, you didn't notice the camera? Oh. Of course yes. I didn't notice the camera. You can't even talk to me in my face. Many more questions. It's unprofessional. Now, now, but you want to go and ask another question. I'm not going to take it. But this is unprofessional. Okay. My, my bad. I, I thought you noticed the camera. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to thank you for answering my question. That's all. Just no. Well, I, I've been ambushed before on this, this issue. Okay. We weren't trying to ambush you. So just, you know, it's, it's, and I don't want you to. You can do whatever you want, but it's unprofessional to tell somebody to start asking a question. I'm not where I'm talking. Did you, were you thinking film? Uh, no, I was just, I was just going to thank you. When I was talking earlier? Well, yeah, yeah, earlier. I thought for what? I thought we were open to taking film. I was I was documenting the event. I just wanted to thank you for answering the Never, questions. ever walk up. It's very unprofessional. Okay. To walk up to somebody, ask them a question in a student group, be taking a film for YouTube. Okay. Do that. I understand. I just, I just want to object. I'll turn it off for you. You can do anything you want. Okay. I'm just telling you up front. Okay. Okay. I, did, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to be rude or disrespectful. Okay. Right. No, I know. What are you going to talk about? A fraud? No, it wasn't a fraud, but I'll be glad to talk to you if you'll shut up and let me talk now. And a fraud? Let me tell you something. I'll tell you a couple of stories about fraud. The Bohemian Club. The, as you say, the Bohemian Club? That's where all those rich Republicans go up and stand naked against redwood trees, right? <laughs> I've never been to the Bohemian Club, but you ought to go. It'd be good for you. Get some fresh air. Listen, uh, I, I am a, 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 a happy member of the Bohemian Grove. I like the, uh, the folks who come there. And uh, it's really inappropriate for me to uh, talk about a uh, uh, the group beyond that. Thank you. Have you been there for the ceremony with uh, the cremation of care? Uh, frankly, that's uh, that. Uh, I don't think that's something I need to talk to you about. Have you been there for the ceremony with uh, the cremation of care? Uh, uh, frankly, that's, uh, that, uh, I don't think that's something I need to talk to you about. Really? That's right. Well, I'm Alex Jones, and I snuck in there in 2000. I'm the guy that blew it wide open and got the video. It's been on national TV. Well, I disrespect you for that. You do? I do. But there's a lot of big public officials going in there. You don't we deserve to know? You took it. I don't know anything about you, and I don't know anything about your film. But if you go in there with an understanding, you violated that understanding by releasing that film, and I don't respect you for that. Really? Well, you, yeah, you, I'm sorry, you public. took an understanding when you went in there that you would not do that film. And you did, did you have an understanding when you went in there? No. Did you crash it? Yes. Yeah, and it has no trespassing signs there, too, doesn't it? No, they put yes. them after. Oh, I'm I sorry. Just in. I'm sorry, sir. I've been there before. I know what, I know what the circumstances are, and I'm sorry you uh, violated the understandings. But it was not, that was not a gentlemanly thing to do. But what about the ritual? Is the ritual gentlemanly? <laughs> Sir, everything. Uh, you, I, I, don't, I don't owe you this comment. I know. You, 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 you have. You. This is what's called ambush journalism, and I disrespect you for that as well. So thank have you, you ever and goodbye. Been the ritual? That's none of your damn business. Oh. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, 
and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. 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 No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence. And the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that 
government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent.